Honorable Chief Minister, Mr. Chairman, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, allow me to congratulate the Penang Institute for successfully holding this inaugural conference on an issue which I think will determine the future of our countries and of our children in the region. A coalition for clean governance in ASEAN is a very relevant movement that will enable us to reach our full potential as we establish the ASEAN community. Let me reiterate the fact that in three years' time, all 10 Southeast Asian nations will form a single community. Economic community, socio-cultural community, and also political security community. It is an ambitious integration program which will result in having a single production base and a single market for all 10 Southeast Asian economies. And the potential for growth and opportunities is enormous. People recognize that the Asia Pacific region and the Southeast Asian region is one of the fastest growing region in the world. Economically, we are expected here in this region to provide a dynamic and powerful force that would generate global economic growth. But as we see from other regional integration, notably now the problems that we have in Europe, we know that integration is not easy. All individual members of any grouping will have to go through a period of adjustment. And it's not just about economic adjustments or economic policy making, but the political dimension, the importance of institutions in individual nations that make up this community will do much to determine the success or failure of integration. So despite the high growth that we are experiencing, the expectations that we will be successful, none of this can be taken for granted. Rather, we need to make sure that we have an environment, a culture, if you like, that will support us through our integration program so that we can fully realize this great potential of peace and prosperity in the region. Recently, economists have tried to answer the question why some nations or some regions are successful and why others, why others fail. And despite much debate, there now appears a, to be a convergence of views that what really determines the economic success and growth of a, an economy or a country or a region boils down to the set of institutions that exist and the process of governance. In particular, throughout economic history, any country, any society that has institutions which are inclusive, that encourage free and fair competition, that uphold the rule of law, that encourages participation, these economies will be successful and will continue to grow in a sustained manner. On the other hand, institutions that tend to concentrate powers in the hands of the few, institutions that rather than generate growth actually try to extract the benefits of growth into the hands of those in power, will find sooner or later that growth can no longer be sustained. This is a very important insight and a fact that I think is very important as we build our institutions, build our nation, and build our communities. That is why the issue of governance and democracy cannot be separated from the issue of achieving economic growth and prosperity. They must go hand in hand. And it would be very rare for any country that wants to liberalize, that wants to reform its economic systems while maintain political institutions that simply cannot keep up or match those kinds of changes 
and reforms. And vice versa, it will be also very rare for any country to successfully pursue political reforms without achieving the kind of economic reforms that will generate growth and prosperity to support that process too. Which is why I think much of the discussion at this very conference concentrates on the need to have a strong democracy that will support good governance, clean governance, so that we can realize our common aims of peace and prosperity. And while democracies and good governance are not synonymous, each can feed on each other and each can support each other. For me, coming from Thailand, we have had a long experience of struggling with the process of both democratization and the fight against corruption to achieve clean governance. We are at the moment trying to write yet another constitution. I've almost lost count. <laughs> and I've certainly lost count of the number of coups d'etat that we've had in the country. But one common factor every time that there is a coup in Thailand, the coup makers always cite a reason for taking their actions, and that is there is too much corruption. That's why throughout my political career, I am very determined to make sure that the parliamentary system becomes successful in Thailand, has the kind of immunity against these kinds of extra constitutional changes. And to achieve that, we really have to work on the issue of achieving clean governance. Over the last decade, Thailand has taken a number of innovative steps to try to fight this problem. We have set up a, an independent counter-corruption commission, which used to be an agency at the Prime Minister's office. Now an independent institution, an independent organization, which has specific powers granted to it by the Constitution. And we have a number of mechanisms that have been enforced. Asset declaration, conflict of interest law, freedom of information law, and of course, continued improvements on regulations concerning procurement. I know that the state of Penang has also taken these significant steps with good results to support uh, these uh, measures that have been taken. And I'm pleased to see that there is clear progress if we try to implement these measures. Nevertheless, despite all the new mechanisms that we put in place, new legislations that we put out, we continue to face a number of challenges. And I'd like to offer you some thoughts which I think are particularly relevant as we move forward in our fight against corruption. First of all, we have to recognize that corruption itself goes through a kind of evolution. Corruption today is quite different from forms of corruption that we witnessed maybe a decade or two decades ago. Still, for many, when they think of corruption, they think of the kind of petty corruption, bribery at the lower levels of government. They think perhaps about basically outright theft, stealing from the people's from people's taxes or budget. But in fact, corruption has become much, much more sophisticated than that. We have collusion in bidding. We have policies that are in fact designed so that the people who implement those policies benefit more than the people those policies are meant to serve. And of course, every time we legislate we have a new law in place, we have a new tool to fight against corruption in place. The people who are engaged in corruption move a step further. They find the loopholes, they look for new ways of engaging in corrupt practices. So there is no way that we can rest on our laurels when we have any kind of success. We have to continue to be acutely aware that this threat is always going to be there 
and we always have to adapt and find additional measures to fight the evolving forms of corruption. Secondly, to be successful in the fight against corruption, you really have to make sure that there are fullest disclosures or as much disclosures as possible. People who engage in corrupt practices, they are afraid of light, of transparency, of people knowing what is going on. Which is why we need to have a number of measures put in place to make sure that the public, the people, know what is going on as far as the business of government is concerned. 